everyone. Welcome back to DNH TV. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I am Chris Phillips, uh, and I am so happy to be with you as we continue our flexible workspace uh, series. And today we're talking mostly about how we can manage our security within a flexible workspace. And to do it, I've got probably the best two people here at DNH to talk flexible workspace and security. Starting us off with Josh Schaffner. Josh, how's it going today? Hey, Chris. Very nice to meet you. Um, I guess not. To meet me? Well, this is the first time we've met? Hold on. Oh, I know. No, I'm, I'm very excited for this. Uh, well, my name's Josh Schaffner. Yeah, why don't, why don't you introduce the people that haven't met you? And I'm going to take notes because apparently I haven't met you yet. So let me get a piece oh, of paper and let's go. Thank you. No, my name's Josh Schaffner. I am the vendor agnostic sales engineer here at DNH for networking, security, and power. I, I've been working here for a little over three years. I come from the MSP side of things, so I was a customer of DNH's uh, for over 10 years before I decided to join them. All right. Um, and we also have the one and only Colleen Salmon. Colleen, how's it going today? Great, great, great. Happy you to be give, here. I, unlike Josh, background? have yeah. met you. Oh, okay. Have met you Fantastic. Before, so. I thought you looked familiar. <laughs> I can't live that down. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. No, every time I see you from now on, I'm going to say nice to meet you. This is the <laughs> life you live now. My name is Colleen Salmon, and I am one of the engineers here on our Cisco desk at DNH. And um, while we do handle the whole gambit of the portfolio, I specialize in the security. So happy to be here. Awesome. So uh, going through a little bit of housekeeping before we kind of get started to the meat and potatoes today, uh, we do have a Q&A window. Let me go ahead and highlight that for you guys. If you have any questions or comments throughout this entire broadcast, uh, please feel free to add them in there. We already see uh, 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 hello from Seattle in, in the, the comment section, so great to see it. Um, uh, we will be talking about a variety of different different topics, so uh, your feedback is, is is also great to hear. We'll also be doing some polling questions, and if you don't feel like adding a comment or question, uh, the polling questions are another great way to add your voice to this conversation, because uh, even though we've got Josh and Colleen on uh, on the mic here today, uh, you're just a part, you're just as part of this conversation as we are, so we we'll, would love to hear from you. Uh, but to kind of get started, um, this is kind of the last uh, flexible workspace uh, broadcast we're doing this year. So I wanted to kind of uh, start off with a, a, a general uh, feeler of where we're at right now in the, the market. Uh, Josh, like laptops, tablet, tablets, mobile devices, those are all things that still are of high demand. That demand has dropped since the early days of the pandemic, but that demand still exists. It can limit the, the devices you can purchase. Uh, the specs that are available and, and other things like that. Uh, what are you seeing right now in the uh, market about these devices and what are some best practices you can continue to take advantage of uh, as we progress through this kind of new world we live in? Yeah, so uh, this, this should be common knowledge, but some people may not be completely aware to uh, the effect of happy and comfortable employees make much more productive employees. So the last thing you want to do is be putting employees in environments outside of the workspace, the, the office that they're used to, um, and make it harder for them to do their job. It's going to make them unhappy, grumpy, and their production is, is definitely going to go down. So you want to try and accommodate whatever workspace uh, that they have to work out of. You want to make sure that they're as comfortable and uh, productive as possible. So there, there's kind of four scenarios now that, that are common for flexible workspacing, and that's uh, the first one's working from home. So when you have an employee that's working from home, uh, you kind of need to make sure that they have all the tools needed to successfully work there. Now, there's many distractions at the home environment that you can't really plan for, but making sure that they have something like a laptop, um, maybe even a desktop PC, tablet, whatever it may be, a docking station that they can keep at their house, monitors that they can keep at their house, the cables needed to connect all that stuff together, uh, wireless or wired mouse and keyboard, a headset, um, a wired or wireless printer, uh, webcam, and a lot of these things I'm saying are USB devices and there's, so, there's only so many ports on, on a laptop and a, a docking station, so sometimes a USB hub are all 
all great things to consider for that environment. Uh, another environment that, that you got to kind of plan for in, in some of these places are anywhere that's outside of your home, but not inside of your office. So whether they're working, you know, at a Starbucks or at a hotel, whatever it may be, in those cases, you really want to make sure that they, they obviously have a portable device that they can work out of. So a desktop PC is a good fit there, something like a laptop or a tablet, um, a wireless mouse or keyboard, a uh, headset, a mobile printer if needed. Another USB hub could come in handy and uh, something to carry them all in, you know, a carrying case, a backpack, something like that. That way they can pile all that stuff in. Um, if they're going from their house to one of these scenarios, they can just undock their laptop, put it in their backpack that has all these things already in it, and then they can work wherever they want. Um, then the other two scenarios are, are kind of similar, and they're both back at the corporate office where some people are going to have their own personal desks still and in those environments it's it's what you're typical to using whether it's a laptop or a desktop pc tablet whatever it may be a docking station monitors that type of stuff that doesn't go anywhere the cables that they need for that wired or wireless mouse keyboard headset all that good stuff um and then access to some corporate printer or something like that um webcam that all that stuff is good and then there's there's something that we're actually uh, implementing at DNH here, and that's more of a hotel environment, hoteling environment at the corporate office where nobody really has an assigned desk. Uh, there's just lots of workspaces where all you really need to do is bring your laptop in, you dock it in a docking station that's hooked up to monitors, and there's already a mouse and keyboard, tablet, everything that you need there to uh, properly work. Um, those are the, the main environments now that we have to account for. So there's so many different accessories that, you know, people may kind of bat an eye out and say, you know, why do I have to pay these expenses for my employees? But most of the time in a very short period of time, uh, w when you outfit your employees with those things, it will it will make up for the money uh, in a heartbeat. It'll pay for itself. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to touch on is licensing. You just got to make sure that you have the right licensing, whether it's Microsoft Office or whatever it may be, so that people can uh, use the, the programs and applications that they need to on the on the devices that they need to access them from. Excellent. Uh, Tony is right. I should be offended that people aren't uh, are denying that they know me. <laughs> I, I don't know what I did. But but apparently there's a concerted there's a concerted effort of people that just don't that are, are disavowing knowledge of me. So the bet I made, I will lie in it forever. Eight minutes into this broadcast, we're already off the rails. I pushed <laughs> out a poll question. Uh, I wanted to ask uh, the people that are watching how many, uh, what percentage of the the, the uh, workforce that they're seeing is still in a flexible environment. And as Josh says, those that flexible environments are 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 really kind of starting to evolve like josh said like we personally here at dnh have moved from having our own desk to having kind of work areas that we can uh rent a a rent a desk basically for a day uh so when our groups come into the office to to meet and to see, see face to face you know like i meet colleen on a, on a weekly basis uh we have a place to go a place to put our laptop and the uh supplies we need to work um right now and as a result of the poll question uh still people are saying more than 50 52 percent are saying more than half their workforce is working remotely and that would be true of us as well there's only five percent that are saying it's none they've gone back full um that number will continue to creep up and you know i'm going to push up on push out another poll question as we kind of keep talking here because i want to know how long do you think we're going to stay in this flexible workspace environment? Because we're clearly still in it today. You know, your guys' feedback states that as well. Uh, but as we kind of do that, I want to pivot a little bit and start talking about securing those devices because we are now seeing flexible workspaces where people are not only bringing their work devices in, they're bringing their personal devices in. It could be, you know, a bring your own device uh, company policy for security. Um, it, it, there's a lot of different things uh, uh, in play here. So I wanted to talk uh, quickly, actually, I don't want to say quickly, but I want to quickly bring up, uh, there has been uh, a more of a, a buzzword that's kind of come up recently uh, called zero trust. And this is to, to Josh or Colleen. Uh, can you, either of you describe what zero trust is and, and if it is important to a security strategy right now? I, I can touch real quick on it, unless you want to, Colleen. 
Um, well, you can go first, and I can add on to that. <laughs> uh, zero <laughs> trust to me is just a buzzword. Um, you know, there there's so many people that are being told things now, like SSL VPN isn't good enough um, to to meet a certain compliance that now you actually need some type of <clears throat> zero trust network, zero trust infrastructure, whatever it may be to, to meet a compliance. And and I always love when, when I get those requests or those opportunities that get kicked over, because I say, please give me that literature that says all this, because most of it is is just marketing terms so that you buy more stuff. Um, you know, it, it it's, it's one of those things where there's no such thing as a zero trust compliance. Like that you, it doesn't matter how much money you spend, how many devices you buy, how many licenses you have. Um, you're not going to get, you know, the zero trust compliance. And even if you do buy all the things that will get you to a zero trust compliance and you, and you implement them, it doesn't mean that you're zero trust compliant. You have to make sure that they're configured properly. And that's, that's really what, what a lot of this comes down to is just making sure that, you know, proper security policies are in place. Um, things like password complexity policies, uh, multi-factor authentication, making sure that firewalls have the correct ACLs and firewall rules in place, um, and then that there's there's proper auditing to, to just see kind of what's going on behind the scenes when people aren't watching. Um, and it, it varies from business to business. Some businesses uh, are, aren't cloud-based at all, so they don't have to worry about the cloud edge and, and you know securing all the resources that are up in the cloud. Um, it's it, it just pretty much a matter of, of analyzing where people access the resources that they do, what devices they access them on, and uh, where the resources that they're trying to access reside, and uh, figuring out where the potential risks are involved in that, and then prioritizing those risks to make sure that, you know, sometimes there, there might be a ton of risks, and it's just up to, you know, whoever's in charge of your security to kind of make a roadmap um, based on those prioritized risks to determine how you can get to where you want to be. Um, zero trust, you know, it, it's doing things like assuming that there's always internal and external threats, that the that all networks are hostile, um, nobody's trustworthy, uh, each device, each user, uh, each network, um, everybody's being authenticated and authorized and, and audited, um, making sure that policies uh, are, are dynamic to some degree and that they account for sources that are coming from pretty much anywhere possible. Um, if you're trying to access cloud resources or things like that, the, the whole public has access to that and it's it's locking down who can access what. And if somebody does become, you know, if somebody becomes compromised, if somebody gets their device stolen, as soon as IT knows that they can shut that device down so that it'll never be able to to, to access anything. And even if they do get access somehow, that things like the principle of least privileges is, is in place so that they don't have the, the keys to the castle, essentially. Colleen, uh, what are your thoughts on zero trust there? Um, do you agree with Josh? Do you don't agree? And if you don't agree, I'm rooting for you in this argument. <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely. I think, I think Josh hit the nail on the head in terms of zero trust. Now, zero trust is a buzzword that has been around for a while. I think because of the pandemic, it has thrusted us into a, a scope where we now have to look at, as he mentioned, you know, who are who is accessing our network, um, what applications or devices are accessing. So it just kind of gave us a, a smack in the face as you know, mm -hmm. not to put it too bluntly, that um, we need to be more secure in who we're letting allowing into our organization and who's accessing applications that maybe shouldn't have before. So, I mean, as Josh mentioned, it's it puts zero trust puts everything under a single umbrella. So, from a Cisco perspective, they kind of created a simplified if you can use that term with Cisco, <laughs> roadmap where um, they've broken down zero trust into, um, you know, three different three different spectrums where it's workload, where you're you're securing all of your connections in your app across the multi cloud, multiple applications within your cloud or on prem. Then you have the workplace where you're you're securing those devices across, even including your IoT. 
and then for your workforce who are not in the office or maybe in the office, you're making sure that the, that access is limited to whatever they need to, to be productive um, during that time. So um, it's, Zero Trust is going to vary depending on the organization because different organizations require different things. And as Josh mentioned, Zero Trust is not going to be found in one solution you have a, a gambit of solutions that across the board that you would have to put in place in order to quantify when it comes to, to saying you're zero trust. Now, partners can start out that practice and still be effective um, in, in different areas, but zero trust is never going to be found in one product solution, no matter what any vendor might say. Yeah, I, I'd agree with you there. Um... Real quick from from the the viewers, we had, we had Bradford who uh, was was speaking about flexible workspace in terms of the the hardware he's seeing seeing a lot of uh, portable monitors that attach to the back of laptop uh, for mobility. Uh, he's asking if we're seeing trends like that. I would say yes, just from uh, seeing the requests that come in to our our presales technical support group, uh, presales at dnh.com. A lot of people. Rather than just buying monitors, they are buying devices that clamp on the back of monitors, flip out, and give you either one or multiple displays that plug it right into uh, the lightning port. It's it's a new type of accessory that has really taken off, uh, especially since uh, 2020. Uh, so I would agree there. Tony had some feedback on zero trust. Um, uh, actually, real quick, I wanted to talk about uh, the, the the poll question when we have to get the Tonys. Uh, we, we did the, uh, how long do you see fl flexible workspace being relevant? Uh, seven or 6% of people were less than five years. Uh, 13% were, uh, uh, five to 10 years. And that's kind of where I fall to. I actually believe we'll be back to, uh, situations where a majority of us will be in some kind of office, uh, more often than not four days a week or more. Uh, within five to 10 years. Um, that's just my feeling. I could be totally wrong because 80% of you see it's going to be happening for the foreseeable future also could happen. Uh, I can only speak for, for us as a company. We haven't seen like productivity or, 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 or innovation or anything uh, start to decrease uh, because of work from home. Um, I've enjoyed flexibility of being able to work from home. I'm sure you, Colleen and Josh, have uh, enjoyed flexibility as well being able to better manage your work and life uh, approach there. Um, so uh, what are you guys' thoughts on that? What do you guys see? Uh, uh, how long do you see the flexible work environment kind of lasting for? People got a taste of what it's like to, to, to do this, and a lot of people loved it. And now it's <laughs> yeah. something that you can kind of, you can dangle that in front of your employer and say, hey, if you don't allow me to do this, I got somewhere else to go that does. It does, and yeah. even if they don't pay me the exact amount of money, could be even a little less, that convenience factor is nice. And like you said, if productivity isn't taking a dip, mm -hmm. um, it, it, I, I love seeing people face to face. Um, you know, do I, you I love... <laughs> really <laughs> believe it or not? Yes. And I, and I do remember you when I see you face to face, but, uh, it, there's, there's a lot of pluses and minuses and it's, it's definitely a juggling game for, for uh, businesses and management to, to figure out, but I, I, I don't think it's going anywhere um, ever again. I think it will get modified um, in the foreseeable future, but I, I think that, that it's here to stay to some degree. All right, 20 minutes in, I'm calling it. That one's dead. All right, we'll, 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 let, you, we'll let it go. Colleen, what do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I, I definitely foresee this as a, a continuance of, of things to come. Um, as Josh said, it may be modified, but if your organization isn't seeing a dip in productivity or loss in sales, then I don't see any reason why an employer would want to restrict a flexible work environment because a happy happy employee is a you know happy yeah. and productive. Uh, oh, man. Sue's chimed in. Uh, thinks that companies have found that remote work has 
uh, cut overall overhead in terms of the expenses, which mm-hmm. makes uh, it more lucrative for them as well. I would cost absolutely yeah. agree with agree, agree with you. I'm I'm sure mm-hmm. that um, the cost of operations for our corporate office has dropped significantly, mm-hmm. and uh, we're able to to take that cost savings and reinvest that elsewhere. Um, yeah. And I wanted to get back to to Tony's comment on zero trust because we're going to kind of start to move forward in the security uh, talk here. And I thought it was relevant. Uh, Tony kind of agrees with both of you. Uh, I believe it's a buzzword as well. There used to be he says there used to be one of two security approaches, uh, which where you denied all or uh, and allowed what's needed and then you allow all and deny problems. Zero Trust was using one of those because everyone adopt or Zero Trust isn't using one of those because everyone adopted the second approach, which is what most of us do. We, oh, uh, we allow all and deny the problems. Um, so he kind of agrees with you there, and he he says that now they're trying to bolt on other types of security, and that leads us to a great next point of what security layers are we seeing out there in the SMB. If zero trust isn't the answer, which ones are we seeing and which ones are the most effective and, and what do they do? And we'll start with Colleen. Um, well, it's not to say zero trust isn't the answer. Zero trust is just an umbrella mm-hmm. and everything that you put underneath it or incorporate with it becomes that zero trust, um, I, I guess, ecosystem as you might want to put it. So. Mm-hmm. Um, when it comes to our partners, especially when it comes to SMB, for partners that are looking to kind of start out their security practice, I usually recommend the go-tos. Um, you hit Cisco umbrella for DNS, that frontline protection when it comes to um, securing your users, whether they're on or off-prem, and you have Cisco Duo. Duo makes you making sure that your users who are logging on is who they say they are, because let's face it, as in a uh, work from home environment, corporations, especially with GNH, we've hired quite a few new team members Mm -hmm. and not all of us have met in person or know how the other looks, as Josh would say. But um, I said I was in. I didn't say she was (laughs) done. When it comes to when it comes to um, knowing who that user is, you want to make sure that you have something like Duo in place to authenticate those users, whether it be through SMS. Um, the Duo app is our preferred use, but then you have the tokens, which most most of our our federal partners, or I should say, our our state and and school um, entities might want to to gravitate to. But there's a lot of solutions out there in terms of with, or I should say authentication methods with Duo and putting Umbrella as your first line of defense. Both of those things are are easy to set up. They're cost effective. And it's also all licensing. So you're not looking at any type of, of hardware overhead. You're not waiting and being bogged down by shipping constraints when it comes to equipment. So those two solutions are usually our go-to then to kind of round it out obviously we have um uh secure endpoint which is our amp for endpoint service that goes on any laptop you have your file retrospection you can do quite a number of things your advanced malware protection is where that would be coming from then you have obviously any connect any connect for vpn where you're encrypting your traffic going on you going through your network so those four product sets are usually my go-to when recommending when partners contact us to start out a a security practice and they want to be cost effective excellent i'm going to go ahead and push out a a poll question i actually think i pushed out the results i'm actually going to push out the question this time uh now that we've kind of we've kind of talked about these uh, I want to get your guys' feedback on what you guys are currently selling right now um, because that would be a, a great marker into that. Uh, Belinda did want to come to your your rescue, Josh. She said your head is so full of awesome technology knowledge that sometimes you might forget a face. So oh, she's, <laughs> she's, she's got your back. 
She's uh, being kind. <laughs> Josh, 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 what are you, what are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, we 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 just we we keep being hit with so much misinformation right now. People that are that are panicking because they're getting letters or documents or emails from from various compliance organizations mm -hmm. saying, you know, you have to, for instance, like I said before, you, SSL VPN isn't secure enough that you now need to go with the zero trust solution. And it's like that is completely false information. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Please send us over that kind of information so that we can, you know, break it down and, and, and try to see what they're trying to actually say. But um, a, a, a lot of people that there's two approaches that a lot of people are trying to do. It's the siloed approach where everything's working together very much like Cisco is. So they're all communicating, they're all talking together. Um, there's pros and cons to that. In my opinion, there's you know, it, it's awesome that they're all working together and you get a lot of information that, you know, when devices and, and different things are talking to each other, uh, they can do a lot of cool things that, that you can't when you when you have more of a siloed approach um, where you have different vendors in each thing where my big thing is, you know, what if what if that one vendor gets compromised? What if there's, a, you know, some type of flaw that vulnerability that that's found out and then everybody's you know at risk thankfully that that doesn't really happen too much with with the big guys like cisco so uh, i see a little bit of a different thing than than what colleen sees but um moving from you know your the the, the stateful firewalls that that people used to be able to get away with whether it was a small mom and pop shop they're now actually looking at the next generation firewalls now and actually understanding that you know, even though we're a small business that that may we, we don't think that people are out there to get us. We're too small. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that's the wrong approach. As long as you're you have something that's accessible to the Internet, um, you're you're at risk. But now reputation is such a big thing. And I, I know it always has been, but it's, it's something that you really need to take into account now that just because you you know, it's not a huge deal if you get compromised. What if you're a small mom and pop shop that does, you know, business with somebody else and then there's some credit card company or whatever it is that you have access to and they have access to you, whether it's through VPN or whatever it may be, um, your security risks could potentially put some of their stuff at risk, too. And once you burn that bridge and you have that reputation of you don't care about security, um, it's really hard to build that back up and get people that want to work with you. Yeah, I would I would agree with you there. Like like it doesn't take much for for to, to damage your reputation. So it, it's really important to always put your strongest foot forward and and not uh not take chances. Um yep. and and I completely agree with you those days where you can just put a firewall on a business and just go I right, call it a day. That's completely yeah. over. But uh, on the topic of firewalls, uh, is is those physical uh, firewall devices still uh, necessary in, in a security uh, solution? And what other things should people be kind of taking advantage of as they build out their security portfolio for a business? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, when you're looking at a simple firewall is not going to to protect your network as it did, you know, 10, 15 years ago. So you're definitely looking at next gen services where you're incorporating IPS, um, heavier, heavier um, functionalities in terms of advanced malware protection, your, your URL filtering. So you can create, you can set up content filtering and, and um, in, in, in different facets, but then also you're looking at, at, um, as I said, advanced malware protection for those um, threats that may seep through and get past maybe an endpoint service or, you know, antivirus didn't catch it. So a firewall is definitely necessary, but that layered approach in making sure that you have those services incorporated onto it is um, the way to go. And then also, especially if you're running different different um, locations, you want to mm -hmm. make sure that you have, you're not tiring yourself out, especially if you're a lean IT organization, you have something to manage those firewalls in those different locations. So a centralized solution to manage those boxes so you can push down policies and, and create new rule sets and not have to go to, you know, each individual firewall in order to incorporate those those um, new new 
templates that you're or rules and and policies that you're pushing through. So you want to make sure that you're easy you're easing your organization the the overload off of yourself and making that product work for you when you implement it within the organization. And if you have a single pane of glass solution where you can manage multiple customer sites from, you know, the same single pane of glass, I know that's another buzzword that people use all the time, but it really does make a difference. You really yeah. can cut down your IT security. And this isn't to say, you know, oh yeah, do this and this so you can fire this and this employee. It's just making their lives a lot easier. And most engineers that I know are already overtaxed, so they will greatly appreciate things like that. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, one of the one of the things that I recommend to partners, um, especially partners who we have a lot of them who are are single, are single um, person shops where they do everything. You know, they're the they're the technician, they're the plumber, they're the they're the driver, they're everything. So, um, making sure that you incorporate Cisco um, Secure X which is a new platform that Cisco came out with about a year and a half ago, but it's it's picking up, it's ramping up now, and Cisco is always, Cisco Talos is always adding new features into it. And what it does is it's a free license that you can uh, get with any firewall purchase, you can get it with the um, AMP for endpoints, any of the annuity licensing products. Um, it allows you to incorporate it in a single pane of glass, then um, you can create case books. So, I mean, if you have multiple, if you have multiple employees working in within the environment, if I if they're set to come in at different times, if I'm working on a certain issue in the morning, and Josh comes in in the afternoon, then Josh can actually pick up what where I left off if it wasn't resolved, or he can just see what I've done throughout the day. And those case books within SecureX really makes a difference. Partners are really seeing that productivity increase and just making sure that you're you're putting your time to other things that, you know, and not spending hours on things that can be mm -hmm. easily resolved. Yeah. And all like this stuff is building up, you know, not having to go on site to fix every little problem. You can now yep. do a lot of this stuff remotely without remotely. ever having to leave the office, leave your house, leave whatever environment you're in, which uh, is is a godsend. Yeah, Colleen, I, I do like I do appreciate that you you uh, called out that you know a lot of the IT professionals out there are doing everything, uh, including the plumbing because because I know Josh so well, he loves his. Uh, networking is the plumbing of the, the IT uh, <laughs> analogy. So uh, it kind of fit right in there still. Uh, okay. A question that, that Betty uh, brought up in chat is uh, since uh, we people have started working more, more remotely more, uh, how much have we seen uh, growth or how much growth have we seen in secure VPNs? Because it used to be a VPN used to kind of just be something that you used to connect branches together. It was rarely kind of used mm -hmm. as this wide thing that connected thousands of employees back to the home office. So uh, is is most people adopting that approach or are they adopting more of a cloud approach where they don't have to necessarily give everyone VPN access to still access all the documents? Uh, what are your thoughts on that one? I don't know. Client, the VPN services, especially any connect is one of our biggest products that we sell. Um, um, initially during the pandemic, we couldn't even keep up with, with partners requesting it, but after so it hasn't tapered off at all. So um, I think that the need for VPN has, especially around the client VPN side mm -hmm. of things is, is, has definitely increased. And I don't see it going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. Um, especially if we're we're going to, I think it'll it'll more than likely morph into um, a additional services, but um, yeah. client VPN will still. Oh yeah, and, and that, that was a big point, and still is for many people because a lot of people got firewalls or gateway devices that could mm -hmm. account for let's say 10 to 15 percent of their workforce you know let's mm -hmm. maybe it's 10 percent of their workforce before covid and whatnot 
work remotely outside sales reps or whatever it may be. Well, now you have to account for 80 to 100% of your employees. Exactly. So sizing those things were bad. And people still, I mean, I, I still hear it. People are still dealing with that stuff where they're opening RDP port 3389 to the public <laughs> because they have a device that won't allow as many concurrent VPN connections as they need. And I'm just thinking, oh my God, oh my God. Um, mm -hmm. It's 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 a problem. I I will say in terms of like uh, like uh, client VPN. I mean, we're talking twenty years ago. Like the setup of that process it was it was very difficult. I am like over the moon with a lot of what I see in the client VPN world. That that the process has become much more easy to use. Uh, thanks to things like AnyConnect um, and, and other programs out there. Uh, so. It's less daunting for for people to use. Um, uh, Tony just kind of chimed in also in the chat that VPNs uh, to protect the traffic are popular. However, yeah. for performance and security and remote access and, and things like VDIs, uh, he he's seeing more uh, uh, success going to the cloud. Oh, one hundred percent. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I would agree. I would agree there. Uh, lastly, kind of on, uh, on basic, yeah, no, Go ahead. The, the one thing I will say with that is, you know, if you're doing database stuff that's on your machine and it's hooked up to a VPN somewhere else, mm -hmm. you know, if you lose that connection, there's going to be database corruption. So that, yeah. that makes way much, way more sense when it's up in the cloud. And, you know, if you lose your internet connection, you lose whatever your, your data and the databases are still secure and fine. Yeah. Well, Sorry. two couple, two more things before we kind of uh, continue on here. Uh, I do want to talk about the poll results from the last one. Uh, which security solutions are you currently selling? Uh, most people are selling endpoint and multi-factor authentication. Those both sat at 91 and 90 or 83 uh, percent, with bit around 50 percent for DSN filtering and secure VPN. I can understand the secure v VPN. It's not necessarily required in all work mm -hmm. environments. DSN filtering, though, is something you can apply to pretty much everything. Um, you can DSN. apply. Uh, yeah, DNS, DNS. DNS. Sorry. There you go. See, now I, I have a I have a mess up. See, now I got these two jumping on me. The tables have turned. We're, yeah. we're thirty. We're they're thirty seven minutes, and the tables have turned. <laughs> DNS filtering is something you could use everywhere. Um. So. Uh, just quick thoughts on on that uh, how how if you're not currently selling dsn filtering why should that be something you you do well i mean you have partner you have users that are are remote especially you have workers that are traveling from anywhere mm -hmm. so you want to make sure that they are protected at all costs so dns everyone utilizes the internet everyone you know we're all in a in a um, you know fast paced environment where we want everything now. You see a link. Obviously, sometimes you get distracted and you click on links. You need something like Cisco Umbrella, especially to to kind of stop you, <laughs> be that angel on your shoulder to stop you from clicking on those links. So so you don't even really have to think about it when you're inundated. If you're yep. if you're going on the internet, as I said, we we all do. You're protected, yeah. and anywhere you're traveling, you're protected, no matter if you're out of the country. So, and that's yeah. that's why Cisco Cisco does it right. They uh they bought out Open DNS, and um, we love to buy companies. Exactly, and and they <laughs> did it right. Uh, I used that product when I was on the MSP side of things, and. It beat a lot of other alternative vendor solutions because a lot of people, they still use on-prem DNS filtering where if you don't have a connection to that server that's local, yeah. um, you, you don't get updates, you don't get anything like that. And nowadays, zero-day stuff, that's, that's, a top, that's a top thing. And, and when you use something like Cisco's DNS filtering, you get, you know, as soon as there's a zero-day threat that it's de detected and it's it's been integrated into their database, everyone who has that client gets that update. So it's... Absolutely. It's amazing. And then you have Cisco Talos working on the back end um, yeah. to make sure that all those products, security products, um, you know, they're kind of they're kind of like that unspoken angel in the background working well, on the within your yeah. environment, um, making sure that 
any type of malware threats or any any signatures or or files that you unknown files that you may not be aware of that you can actually send that to them and they can uh, investigate that for you and send you those results but they're always feeding that that information they have a repository that partners can check against to make sure that they're you know that they're getting the latest uh, as Josh said that zero day information to to protect and mitigate their network yeah uh Tony you're right Dys dyslexia is a heck of a thing when you to have when you you host a show and you have to read something real quick <laughs> But you also mentioned something too during your comment, Colleen, that you know, there are a lot of things that that like we we get an email, we see a link, we click it, um, and and we don't maybe think things through too much. Uh, well, one thing we haven't talked about is probably one of what I feel is the most important thing for security is just training. Uh, uh, what the talk a little bit about training and how it, kind of it applies to. Uh, you know, security, especially when you're you have people that are all over the world. The biggest threat to any company is that person sitting behind that. Keyboard. Yeah, it doesn't matter how much money you throw at security—a billion dollars. Your your biggest liability will be your employees. Um, Absolutely. 100%. So any investment you make on on having the you know security awareness training, certain campaigns that are out there that that you can do to to see if people are standing on top of it, and if they're failing it, they're just they're a liability waiting to happen. So that's where when you do those campaigns, you have them do, uh, if they fail it, they do additional training that, that has to be completed by a certain date. If not, somebody gets notified and get, they get reprimanded by whatever it means, because this is, this is as serious as it comes for a business. Um, it, it's one of the biggest factors in how businesses lose money and, and get fined and, and, and bad reputation, the, the list goes on and on and on. Um, there, there, there's not enough I can say about security awareness training being, you know, one of the top things that that, that you can invest in that, that you get immediate uh, validation from. Absolutely. I mean, from, from from our perspective, as far as Cisco and DNH, um, we try to very much to enable our partners when it comes to our product sets. And as Josh mentioned, your your product is only as good as the users that you have behind it, utilizing it. And if they're not trained up, then that's definitely a liability. That's an open, that's a huge open vector for you as an organization. And then with DNH, we we've definitely gotten those wombat emails. We 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 get our quizzes and and get those assessments. Stay away from me, Todd Bell. I don't want to do your training. Bell. Absolutely, and it's embarrassing <laughs> when you have to say because you do have to go to those trainings. So it's embarrassing when you have to say, oh, "Okay, well, I'm the security person, and I, you know, I need a I need a I calendar that says this. number of days it's been since Todd Bell has tricked me." Mine's got to be in the thousands of this. About two trucks that are going to be on, on site and then click here for the menu. And yeah, I clicked it. Yeah. And it, I, I mean, it allows your organization and your users to keep up to date with the latest and greatest and know what's out there um, that could hinder your company. But then also from a training perspective, we definitely try to train our partners to enable our partners to then go out and train their customers as well, be that asset for their customers. So we offer from on the Cisco side for security, I usually run an umbrella um, training or I try to do it every quarter. Um, once a quarter, we do a uh, cloud email offering for the new, um, the new cloud email mailbox service, which is mainly for Office 365 partners but it's a great training and it's an easy add-on for partners that are not that don't have the cisco enterprise level email product and are just looking for that extra layer to protect their office 365 customers and then we have the threat hunting which we're about to start in the new year again which allows the you as a partner to become your own uh threat agent you know you can go through and and utilize secure x to monitor and and find those threats within your environment and easily mitigate them and then you're using that as a as a 
stepping stone because that could be an add-on service that you're you're offering to your end customers you know so you're you're managing yourself and then to speak on the umbrella training within that once you've taken that workshop we do offer cisco has what's called the umbrella portal partner portal so once you've done the required trainings for that you're able to get a portal of your own and run trials for your end customer and i i can't tell you how amazing that has been for a lot of partners especially just starting out and trying to learn the product and and sell it that's a great route for any partner to take is to get a console and be able to run those trials for a customer at on demand mm -hmm. so that's that great answers there and and as we kind of come up to the the last 15 minutes of the broadcast we have a couple more topics we want to touch on i also want to kind of quickly touch on a poll question we pushed out uh what are your top concerns when it comes to our when it comes to planning for flexible workspace and and most of the people here are are very security focused and it, it's as you should that's what we're here to talk about today you know obviously pricing of devices is, is still important we we know how much a device should cost and it seems like we're seeing devices out in the market that are costing way more than they should um just because of supply and demand at this point um and then just availability maybe able to get your hands on stuff that's sitting still sitting at seven percent you know two years ago that had been in the, this would probably this whole poll would have probably been reversed two years ago where just getting stuff was three-fourths of the battle and then worrying about the security stuff later so i'm glad to see that focus is kind of start to come full circle just remember we, security breach costs you more than all that equipment put together yeah <laughs> exactly and, and, and reputation which you can't go to dnh.com and buy reputation but maybe we should start to think about selling that not yet <laughs> not yet not our our as a service is coming soon guys <laughs> someone get me on the phone with buy Strect immediately i've got a new vertical i Colleen, have trevor on speed dial yeah i got trevor golly we've talked a lot about uh security uh, uh layers out there is there any more uh, uh adva more advanced security layers out there that we can talk about briefly uh and and who would they kind of apply to um well, a lot of our, our partners, ICE is one of the the more better known products that I would I would recommend to partners. Um, you had mentioned earlier if partners have a B, BYOD um, scenario, um, they're allowing devices and and users to just log into their environment. ICE does what's called posturing, so it helps to to kind of put every all those devices and users and just network assets in one area so you're able to create really hone in on those policies of what's allowed and not allowed within the the organization and who's allowed to to you know access whatever um application and data mm -hmm. um they need and then we have Tetration, that's kind of a, if you're looking for, if you have a partner that's looking for more analytics and visibility, if they have a seam environment or um, um, they're using NetFlow or any of those high, high reporting features, then Tetration is another option for them. StealthWatch is also, it does have a cloud and a, and a on-prem offering. And all those are, are analytic avenues that partners can utilize to just make sure that compliances are set across the board within their environment, especially if you're doing micro segmentation. Um, but I mean, to, to stay in the, the SMB space, I think the go-to would be ICE. I think that's the easiest, would be one of the easiest offerings to layer onto those other products that we mentioned earlier. Nice. So there's one other topic I wanted to talk about briefly here as we're coming up to the end of this broadcast. And uh, it, it it revolves around business continuity and disaster recovery within a hybrid, hybrid environment because uh, security threats can happen. You can either lose the device through due to a security threat, uh, 
ransomware, hacking attack, whatever, some kind of malicious thing, or just straight environmental, that fake snowstorm behind me could get really real real quick, and then all of a sudden you have uh, people without devices uh, that, that are business critical. You know, what are some strategies that people can take advantage uh, to kind of help recover when things happen bad in a remote environment? That's that's actually one of the cool things about hybrid work environments, um, you know, flexible workspace, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, is that not too much has to really change if you're doing things the right way. Um, yeah. People are still accessing the same data in the same locations. Um, they're just doing it from a different spot. So if if you are keeping on-prem backups um, that are valid, so you're, you're doing normal backups for, for things that you can back up on-prem, and if you're doing them out of band, that's even better so that they're, they're on a separate network, separate appliance, whatever it may be, don't need a domain controller or anything like that for it to work properly. If they're getting backed up to a, a device or a server, whatever it may be on-prem, um, and it's encrypted, uh, and then that data is then replicated somewhere else so that okay. that that building blows up, that what whatever happens on premise to that on premise backup, if that goes away. Metaphorically well, blows up, right? Yeah. Metaphorically. <laughs> but if you go to a colo so that it, it's a it, it's a it's private storage somewhere else that, that you have access to, it can be on cold storage, warm storage, hot storage, whatever it may be. Um, it all depends how fast you need that data to be accessed and restored from, or it could be put in something public, uh, you know, stored somewhere in the cloud uh, that, that you'll have access to. Obviously, you know, internet connection really plays plays into there because if you have several terabytes that need to come down for a server to come back up or a database that could come back up, um, you, you want to make sure that, that you have some way to access that faster than 56K dial-up modem speeds. Yeah. Um, that's always good. And, and a lot of people see that, you know, they get an email that says, hey, your backup was good. Okay, that, that's cool that some program told me that backup's good. How do you know when I restore that backup that yeah. it's going to be valid? Now, some, gonna be some things do actually spin those up and, and they'll take a screenshot that shows you, hey, this, this VM was able to be spun up and it, it's fine. But um, it, it's always good to check those out on a regular basis and kind of run through your whole disaster recovery plan. Um, prioritize what servers, what applications need to be brought up first to get mm -hmm. the business critical stuff going and, and then do the rest of the thing. So uh, that, that, that's what I would recommend. You know, you can use things like servers. I know Cisco makes servers that, that you could use for that. Storage devices like NAS and um, um, mm -hmm. SAN, things like that um, to, to actually physically store the stuff on and, and you should be good to go. You're talking about all your uh, your cold storage and warm storage. Like this time of year, I like a good tall grass of room temperature storage right before I go to bed. <laughs> it really helps me get to sleep. Yes, yes. Uh, cold storage means you know it, it's somewhere that that it's not really turned on, and somebody actually has to turn the thing on, and then you get it. So it's not mm -hmm. instantaneous as it is with other means. I digress. Uh, that's all right. Uh, we're kind of coming up to the top of the hour here. If uh, anyone's watching and you have any last questions, comments you'd like to throw out to, to Josh and Colleen, we'll go ahead and take those. Uh, I ran out of questions, so I'll just ask one question out to you guys while we while people may be sending in the last minute questions. Uh, what are you looking for from Santa for Christmas? We are like, what are we out? We're 17 days out from Christmas. What are you, what are you getting, Josh? I want a new chair to sit in. <laughs> a new chair. I got a new couch this weekend. And when I say oh. new, it's like, it's a, it was someone else's couch, but it's mine now. And it was still pretty good. <laughs> Colleen. Um, I am looking to upgrade my office. So hopefully I can get some new equipment in my office. Fingers crossed. <laughs> cool. Uh, Sue was asking if we have any recommendations for best cloud storage. Um, what I would actually say, as I'd, I'd uh, say, go ahead and email uh, modern solutions at dnh.com. They have a whole, we have a whole group of people that are dedicated to cloud solutions, and and they will be able to hook you up with uh, a couple of different options in terms of cloud storage based on what you need as a company. Whether you're looking to do backups, whether you're looking to do uh, file storage or the combination of that, um, that group will be able to help you out uh, 
more so than 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 we would on this call because we're running short on time. So yeah, there's many uh, questions that need to be asked yep. to get you the right yeah. solution. Anyone that gives you a, an answer on a specific one or two is it is not telling you the right stuff. And unless I'm selling the cloud solutions, then it then then you should just buy it from me and it'll work yeah, for everything. Yeah, DSM filtering. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Josh. Thank you, Colleen, so much for joining us today. This has been uh, real fun. Um, if if you guys have any additional questions and you're viewing this on demand, uh, please email us uh, at uh, solutionslab at dnh.com or modernsolutions at dnh.com uh, or Cisco specialist, right, Colleen? That's how we can get to you at dnh.com? Cisco support. Cisco at support DNH. at dnh.com. Uh, and uh, we'll be able to help you out uh, with all those questions. Uh, we do have an upcoming broadcast, but Kayla didn't send them to me. I believe we're back on the 17th of December for a uh, Pro AV webcast. Um, so just go ahead and check dnh.com. Uh, we've got plenty of broadcasts coming up this, uh, this month. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in the next one. But for Josh and uh, Colleen, uh, thank you so much for joining us today. And for everyone else, I hope you guys have a wonderful day. See ya. Thanks for having me. Good holidays, everyone.